And so it goes right through from energy, through food, clothing, heavy industry, and so on and so forth. Every major sector, every major source of emissions in the UK economy. But first it deals uh, uh, with, with energy and then goes on to the other chapters. Now, the purpose of the book was to identify a route to net zero. Um, I'm sure everybody knows what net zero is, but that means no net carbon emissions at some stage in the future, preferably well before 2050, was when, which was when we're mandated to achieve it by our own laws. Um, I think it's possible within 20 years. Should we decide as a society to do it? Uh, some of the decisions that I'm suggesting in the book we need to take aren't easy ones and they won't necessarily be politically possible. And therefore, I've tried to uh, make, make sure that people understand that there are real hard decisions to be made. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to see a significant reduction in our standard of living, but we can't go on doing things pretty much as we are at the moment. The second purpose of the book is to suggest that the green transition, the move to a zero carbon economy in, I hope, 20 years, has a positive effect on the less well off. Um, so every, I, I try on every opportunity to identify the ways in which the routes that I'm proposing should result in people at um, the lower end of the economic prosperity spectrum seeing a benefit. At the end, I want to make sure that people realize that decarbonization is possible and that it's probably highly advantageous, almost certainly highly advantageous. So first of all, please, a little bit about energy generation. Um, so we've done relatively well as a society, British society, at decarbonizing the provision of electricity. And the last few weeks have been in some ways absolutely staggering. Uh, there were moments this afternoon when uh, solar plus wind was providing about 70% of UK electricity generation. Not quite as much as that, but combined with other low carbon sources. And gas was reduced to about 15%. And of course, there hasn't been any coal on the British grid now for what is it? Um, certainly five or six weeks. But electricity generation is only one small part of the problems we face if we're going to decarbonize the British economy. And on this slide are just a few illustrations of the problem areas that we face. We need to move away from a highly carbon intensive agricultural system, uh, cut the amount of livestock farming. We need to electrify heavy vehicles. We need to improve the housing, uh, the, the quality of our housing stock. We face an enormous problem fighting alternatives to conventional aviation. But it's other things also like the manufacture of steel or cement where we don't have a clear route yet to easy decarbonization. Uh, and also things like international shipping represent problems which we haven't even really begin to, begun to think about. So I, I deal with, in the book with each of those in turn. But in general, let's, I would like to first of all deal with um, the electricity and the energy situation more generally. We have in the UK seen a very substantial reduction in emissions from around 800 million tonnes in 1990. This year, probably somewhere between 400 and 450. So norm, we've gone down by approximately a half. It's very important to note that this excludes embedded emissions in goods and services we import into the country. But nevertheless, the picture is one of relative success, but we've still got a long way to go. And the most recent forecast from the Cl Committee on Climate Change suggests that we're nowhere near reaching the targets that the government have set for five year periods between now and 2040. Reduction has principally come, as I've suggested, from decarbonisation of electricity generation, which was the most important sector of emissions 30 years ago, and is now decreasing in importance. And this year will, of course, be the lowest ever, largely because of the roughly 20% reduction in electricity demand that's happened uh, during the last three months. Transport, on the other hand, has gone up or, or, or stayed stable. In the last few years it's gone up as we've moved away from diesel cars for obvious reasons back towards petrol but as importantly the average size of the vehicles we buy has increased <clears throat> and the growth rate of electric cars isn't yet enough isn't yet fast enough to dent that curve so there's one of our most difficult problems the electrification of transport. Right, so what is the government's proposal for how we continue to decarbonize electricity generation and uh, use the electricity 
to its maximum effect, effect for the other things that we can electrify, like transport and like to some extent heat. Well, this is just an illustration four or five weeks ago over the Easter period of where we've got to now and where the problems are likely to occur. These were days around Easter when there was wind and there was a reasonable solar and this pushed well, fossil fuel are uh, pretty much off the grid. But there were times, of course, when there wasn't much wind and there wasn't much solar either at night. And as a result, the gas-fired power stations continue to have to operate. And that's, of course, the daily pattern we see all the time. So even in a period when our renewables are providing a large fraction of our energy demand, they're not, they're not getting rid of the problem of intermittency. The fact is we can't rely on renewables to run our electricity system. So the government has a view of the way that we should move in this country, which is to have gas-fired power stations acting as a minute-by-minute uh, -minute complement to the renewable energy sources. But they don't intend, the UK government, to increase renewable energy that much over the next 20 or 30 years. The majority, <clears throat> and still only about 65% of electricity demand is forecast to be provided by renewables by 2040, with gas plus carbon capture and storage providing the rest. Now, that's, uh, I can go into details to why that might not be a good idea, but it doesn't certainly completely decarbonize because even under the best scenarios, CCS only captures about 90% of the um, CO2 that comes out of power stations. But that's the way the government sees it. In the book, I propose something, a very different route indeed, which is to say, okay, we've got a problem with intermittency. How do we get rid of it? How do we uh, have pretty much all the time as much electricity as we need? And my proposal is um, to expand the amount of renewables we have in the UK by about 20 fold, offshore wind, solar and onshore wind principally. And what this does is that means that almost all the time we have more electricity than we need, even after we've expanded electricity demand by electrifying cars and providing heat pumps for all the houses that can cope with it. And we store the surplus in the form of hydrogen. How do we get that hydrogen? Well, we put it through, we put electricity, surplus electricity through an electrolyzer. Uh, you'll remember that if you have an electrolyzer at one electrode, you get hydrogen. At the other electrode, you get oxygen. That hydrogen can be taken away and stored. It can be then used to generate electricity again through a turbine or through a fuel cell. It can be used, hydrogen can be used for home heating and for other sources of heating. And it can be the key ingredient for synthetic fuels, fuels which are, offer, offer low carbon, very low carbon alternatives to conventional oil and gas at the moment. So that's the route I'm proposing, I propose in the book, and it's a little less eccentric than it might have seemed a year ago when I was writing it, because increasingly countries around, particularly Northwest Europe, are saying actually this is probably the only way we can get full decarbonisation of our economies to run them on the basis of a large renewables fleet combined with hydrogen, uh, which is used to store energy at times when the renewables are insufficient to meet demand. Hydrogen can fulfill most of the energy needs in the economy. That's really a surprising finding over the last few years. In the rest of this presentation, which we probably won't get to, I deal with why, of how in sectors like steel and fertilizers, even in cement, we can use hydrogen very extensively to replace the use of fossil fuels. And of course, hydrogen, when it's used, will either become uh, hydrocarbon, which uh, we'll talk about in a bit, or it will simply be burnt to make water. There's no greenhouse gas emissions resulting from that. So this is, this is my proposal in the book, and I try to justify the, uh, as, being, uh, as being economically rational. This is roughly what a large-scale electrolyzer looks like. They're getting bigger and bigger all the time. The industry is growing at an extraordinarily rapid rate around the world as people more and more see hydrogen as the important vector for energy to make ourselves able to use renewables for 100% of our electricity or near 100% of our electricity generation. Um, this is a one megawatt unit. They come in con standard shipping containers and they are entirely modular. And we're now talking about building uh, renewable hydrogen installations of a gigawatt plus, that's a thousand megawatts, a thousand containers like this in one place. Um, the ambitions have risen dramatically just in the last six months for the use of hydrogen. Where is this most apparent? Where is this, the, this uh, story 
uh, furthest ahead in the UK? Well, it's on the islands of Orkney, off the northwest coast of Scotland. They have a considerable surplus of, of electricity generation. The people on Orkney told me that around 50% of the electricity generated on the islands from tidal power and from wind is wasted. It's curtailed in one form or another. And they decided a few years ago to move the hydrogen, to move to the hydrogen route. There's now a school on, on the islands, which is heated entirely by hydrogen. There's fuel cell buses and cars across the islands. Uh, electricity is regenerated from hydrogen in the main port and so on and so forth. And the list of projects is continuing to increase. A, a couple of weeks ago, there was a completely new project introduced, which allows producers of electricity on Orkney to trade with consumers, directly with, with consumers of electricity. And that's one of the themes in the book. I think it's a very important uh, part of our future, is allowing peer-to-peer -peer trading to encourage local development of renewable energy sources. But it's also done at a much larger scale. This is a plan for the use of electricity from offshore wind in the North Sea, to put through a big electrolyzer made by ITM Power, the company in the middle, which is um, a Sheffield-based company and one of the world leaders in electrolysis, an extraordinary success story over the last few years, generating enough hydrogen to run the hydrogen, to, to fulfill the hydrogen, much of the hydrogen need of the Philips oil refinery on the Humber. Now, of course, this is still part of the greenhouse gas economy, therefore, but it's just an illustration that these things can be done at megawatt, multi, tens, hundreds of megawatts scale. And increasingly, we're seeing this uh, illustrated in projects like this around the world. 20, 200, 20 times expansion of um, offshore wind, for example, is an enormous challenge for us. Um, I'm, I'm excited by the idea, the idea of using man-made islands in the North Sea. This is a project being pushed by the Netherlands grid operator, Tenet. Uh, to enable uh, offshore wind around the whole of the North Sea to be used to, maximum, uh, ex to its maximum extent for the countries around Germany, France, uh, excuse me, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, UK, Norway, and Denmark. Uh, so to enable us to put hundreds of gigawatts of capacity into the North Sea uh, and routed across through interconnectors from man-made islands. This is a project of enormous scale, billions of dollars, billions of pounds need to be spent on it, but it's a way of generating the lowest cost offshore wind. So that's an illustration. I'm also, I also talk in the book about the need to relocalize electricity production and municipalize the, the purchase and sale of electricity. This is an example of how it works in Germany. Uh, Germany has, I think, something like 300 city electricity and, uh, and utility, more generally utility companies. The largest is the one in Munich. This is a photograph from its webpage. It supplies electricity, gas, water, um, runs the baths, mobile phones and broadband amongst many other services. It employs a lot of people, doesn't entirely buy renewable electricity locally yet, but it's intending to move in that direction. <coughs> um, and it's also buying electricity from wind farms in Norway to meet the um, electricity needs it cannot provide by itself. Uh, it's profitable, as I say, it make, employs a, a lot of people and adds a lot of um, uh, skills into the local economy. So and this is the, what I would like to do in the UK to model ourselves, the way we run things here on what's happening in Germany. The second use for electricity, uh, for, for hydrogen, is possibly for home heating. And there's much scepticism about this, but I think it's perfectly possible. This is the newest generation of Worcester Bosch hydrogen boiler developed for the UK market. It can switch between hydrogen and natural gas. It doesn't cost any more than an existing central heating boiler. Hydrogen itself would be much more expensive at the moment. Uh, and we need to work out how to do something about that. I think principally it's by better insulating our houses. But this is an illustration of the fact that we can, in theory, uh, in practice, use hydrogen for the supply of, electric, of, of energy for home heating. And there's various other things. I'll just dash on. I mean, I've got, I mustn't take too much time. Um, we can use hydrogen to make uh, as a renewable source for the making of fertilizer. This is a plant in Western Australia, one of the best places in the world for wind and solar power, uh, which is going to make hydrogen from renewable sources uh, to be incorporated into fertilizer production. Fertilizers, of course, you, uh, made out of ammonia, which is a combination of nitrogen and hydrogen. This is a, a, a next generation of steel plant. Three or four percent of world emissions come from the coal that's used um, in, in, in blast furnaces to make steel. It can be, steel can be made using hydrogen. I mean, the, 
world steel companies are moving very rapidly in this direction. Don't necessarily want to do it, but I think they realize that the era of coal is coming rapidly to an end. This is in northern Sweden, a specialty steel, steel manufacturer called SSAB is generating a plant which replaces hydrogen, which replaces coal entirely with hydrogen for making their high quality steels. We also need hydrogen to make uh, conventional uh, replacements for conventional fuels for things we can't do without, such as fuel for aviation. And we do that through collecting, in my opinion, collecting CO2 from air, hydrogen from electrolysis, and putting it through a conventional chemical engineering process to make all the things that we need, uh, we think we need anyways in modern society, uh, uh, without any carbon, net, net carbon impact. Um, uh, just very briefly, this is a technology which I think is going to, we're going to see a lot more of in the next few years. This is a plant owned by a, a, Swiss, a Swiss company, excuse me, called Climeworks, which captures CO2 directly from the air. It uh, pulls air over, over fans inside those 12 different um, fan structures on this building. Um, uh, a chemical inside collects the CO2 and captures it, and then it's heated and the CO2 is driven off. Pure CO2 is then sent to the greenhouses that you can see right in the back of this picture where it aids plant growth. But this is the first installation of the company Climeworks. It's now seven or eight years old, I think it's now. And Climeworks is beginning to do more and more of this around the world, collecting CO2 for purposes such as this one, which is at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, where CO2 is collected from the air, electrolysis is carried out, which produces hydrogen. And these emerge in a chemical reaction inside the, the bit of the uh, container here on the left, uh, run by a company called Innotech, which uses what's the Fischer-Tropsch process, the standard chemical engineering process, to make diesel out of this process, a zero carbon diesel. So man, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna dash on now because I don't want to take too much time because we need to have some time, a lot of time for discussion. But the book has a chapter on food, and there the principal problem is the use of artificial fertilizers, but more importantly, the fact that our livestock systems generate inevitably a great deal of CO2, uh, of, of methane, particularly sheep and cattle. We almost certainly need to move to a diet which is uh, very, has only a tiny percentage of um, meat and cattle products, possibly very few meat other products as well. Um, I also talk in the book about uh, someone who you probably, many of this audience probably know, uh, John Letts, um, a, a remarkable man who uh, is operating small holdings around Oxfordshire and is using heritage varieties of wheat and other grains, a wide variety of grains, to show that it's possible to generate very reasonable levels of productivity on land which is not fertilized artificially, um, and is not, um, and pesticides or other nasty things aren't applied, or herbicides are not applied to it either. He's able to show that old techniques, um, updated to the modern era of growing grains, generate over a 10 year period at least the same amount of uh, wheat and or grain per unit area as uh, 10 year cycles of mono industrial monocultures in East Anglia or wherever. An extraordinarily interesting man. It's also, this kind of grain is also very much susceptible to drought, less susceptible to drought because the roots are much deeper. And therefore, as the south part of Britain, the southeast part of Britain in particular, becomes drier and drier as a result of climate change, this kind of technology, this kind of advance in agriculture is going to help us enormously. I have a chapter on clothing and what we need to do there, principally to replace cotton and polyester, probably with cellulose-based fibers like Tencel, which is illustrated in this chart. We, yes, we need to move to electrification of vehicles, but also we need to use vehicles much less. And I talk about, for example, the experience of cycling in, in <clears throat> cities in, in the Netherlands, like Utrecht, where 50% of all journeys are now inside the city and now done by bicycle or pedestrian. And where and on, on the right hand side, Pontevedra, which was one of the first cities in the world to institute a car free zone in the center. Um, it's now of course been copied very widely. The important point I try to make in the book is that no, no city that's ever tried this as far as I could find has ever gone back to allowing cars on a large scale back into those cities. This is an advantage to commerce, it's an advantage to people, it reduces pollution, 
it makes the whole place a much more attractive. And, you know, we, I think, need to push Oxford very much in that direction. I, I know there's lots of talk about it, but as the Greens, I think this should be one of our principal planks inside our local area. Uh, we can electrify much shipping. We can't, we can't do much about aviation. Um, and uh, what I think I did want to focus on very briefly, and then I'll go to the last slide, if I may, to uh, give us some time to talk. Um, we do need massively to upgrade quality of British housing stock. We have the worst insulated housing stock in the world, sorry, excuse me, in the developed world, far worse than almost anywhere else in Northern Europe. So far, our efforts to improve that housing have not been successful. The, the little projects to increase cavity wall insulation or loft insulation or whatever have had a minor effect, but compared to the need, the massive need to cut perhaps by two thirds our heating needs in housing, uh, particularly if we move to more expensive hydrogen and replace natural gas. We need massive uh, refurbishment done on the scale of millions of houses a year. This is an early experiment in this. This is a, a, a social housing block of what is it, nine housing, nine houses of which seven were refurbished and two were not because they've, they've gone back into private hands. Um, this is an illustration of just how good you can get a house to be. These were very poorly insulated houses with, house, with heating bills of up to £1,500 a year. Uh, as you can see, they're not large houses either. They, they were outrageously expensive to heat uh, and they've been made to look nicer. They've got solar panels on the roof. They're not quite carbon neutral, but there's a ground source heat pump feeding them. Bills have declined by about 80% uh, and they've become very much more attractive houses to live in. This is expensive. Uh, if we did this on an enormous scale, which I think is what we need to do, uh, it, there's no question that it would uh, require uh, funding for, for generations to come. But I think in today's mood, we probably ought to be pushing in this direction. This is the only way we can get our housing stock, stock up to good quality. Right, I'm going to go right to the end, if I may, and talk about forestry. Um, and I, uh, I advocate a, a massive reforestation program in the UK. Uh, we are the least forested large country in Europe by some margin, by, by, by 70% in fact. And by reforesting, we can improve um, biodiversity, we can improve flood control, but also we can capture a great deal of carbon. But um, the, the last slide I want to go through, if I may very briefly, is why this is good for British society. <clears throat> Uh, and I'm talking here principally about social equity, of course. Better insulated homes will be disproportionately benefit to the less well off. We need to improve public transport, give ourselves a sense that um, uh, private transport is not the only way of running, uh, of, getting, of moving from one place to another. By moving away from private transport, we can lower pollution, including noise pollution. That's particularly important, I know, uh, to people who live in the centre of Oxford. I'm suggesting we can improve our food, particularly if we move away from the low-grade meats that are being promised to us by the Conservative government's negotiations with the US at the moment. We can continue to provide very large numbers of high-quality uh, jobs in renewables as we expand renewables, particularly offshore wind, and do the same thing for forestry and wood products. We can replace, I don't know, the 13,000 or so farmers who farm sheep in this country. Uh, with uh, jobs for many, many times that number if we re relocalize our wood. We're the single biggest importer outside China of wood products in the world. And by instituting a circular economy, we can provide inexpensive second-hand clothing and refashion clothes, uh, building up local employment and skill levels. We can give local control over energy, back over energy, meaning that our cities have a role to play in the provision of very high quality utility services in the way that is possible in Germany. And by running a carbon tax, which I advocate in the book, we can provide a dividend to the less well off from the money that's charged to generate from, 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 from putting emissions for, for those people who put emissions into the atmosphere. So very briefly, that's what the book is about. It's an attempt to show that it's possible and it might actually be a lot of fun. Uh, it's not going to be easy. There are some lifestyle choices involved. And I think we as Greens need, can benefit from discussing how we get wide popular support for the idea that this, uh, this kind of, the, not, not my plan in particular, but moving to a zero carbon society is both the right thing to do from a climate change perspective, but also is likely to be beneficial to society more generally. Kate, thank you.